I mean, I just think music just has to speak to you and you have to love it and then you try to emulate it, you know, and then you find your own sort of, this is how I, this is my feel. Welcome to the Loud Noise Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Walsh. Loud Noise is where I dig into conversations with some of my favorite musicians. Our goal is to share experiences and ideas that you can use in your own creative development. From breakthroughs and challenges to successes and lessons learned, you'll have a front row seat to the best show in town. I'm a guitar player, writer, producer, living in Prague, Czech Republic, via Nashville, via New York City. I've spent my life living the dream and making music. I've had a lot of help along the way, and this is a chance for me to share some of what I've learned with you. So let's crank it up and join me in welcoming today's guest for some loud noise. Andy Hess is one of the most soulful people I know. He's a bass player living in New York City. He's held the bottom down for John Schofield's Uber Jam Band, Robin Ford, Michael Landau, Adam Levy, and Bill Sims Jr. He's also been a member of Warren Haynes' Government Mule and played with the Black Crows. Most recently, he's out touring with Doyle Bromwell II and As the Crow Flies with Chris Robinson, the lead singer of the Black Crows. I've played with Andy in many groups over the years. Andy is first rate and as good as they come, a thoughtful dude with a deep, deep pocket. Our conversation today gets into Andy's childhood living between Germany and California, spending his teenage years watching some of the greatest American blues artists from the kitchen window at a legendary Oakland, California blues club, understanding the value of doubling down on your strengths, life as a New York City bass player, and insights learned from backing up some of the greatest guitar players alive. He's hard to find on the interweb, but does have an Instagram account at Low End Hess, and his website is andyhess.com. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Andy Hess. I moved a lot as a kid, so I, you know, I'm originally from the East Coast, uh, from Washington, D.C., and then we moved to Indiana and lived in Bloomington, and that's sort of you know, I was living there when I think I started first for hearing music and records being played in the house, you know. So it was late, late 60s, early 70s, so there was a lot of good music out. I remember the first record I got was Sgt. Pepper's. And it was cool because, yeah, it was, I mean, that's like my first really, my memory of like, like really listening to a record and going, wow, what is this, you know. Mm-hmm. And at, at first it was really about the cover, that cover like drew me in you know but I also and then it was sort of like oh those are that's the you know this is these are the Beatles and 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 they you know and I remember hearing the record and it was just such a fascinating record because it was trippy mm-hmm. and how, it had old, how old did you be around psychedelic I think I was like maybe nine or ten and it was like maybe the first like my own record you know Anyway, like, so I remember, like, music was around, you know, and then there were... Did you notice the bass? Was the bass well, the no, first I, thing you wanted to play? No, not really. I mean, it was sort of by default. Like, I definitely was into music before I ever thought about playing music. And I was into cool music because then what happened is, uh, when I was nine, I ended up moving to Germany. And that was interesting in that it was it was weird and difficult but um i moved over there with my mom because she's german and uh my dad ended up moving to the bay area so they lived far apart and i had i spent all my summers with my dad in oakland and so i had all these different influences because my dad lived in this sort of he was a college professor and so he at the time in the 70s he lived in berkeley in this communal living you know very california 70s and so I spent all the summers there and all the people that lived there had all their records, you know, sort of all over the house in the, in the main living room. So I would discover all these records there. Like I remember Bob Marley Live was a big record for me. This is when I really started getting into music. Or I remember B.B. King's Live at Cook County Jail because it had that denim cover. So sometimes it was like the artwork I was drawn to and then I would put it on and I'd be like, wow, this is great, you know? Like all that music felt really good to me, but I couldn't really explain why. I just, you know, it was like, those were some records that I really remember. Like, And then my stepfather in Germany actually was a total jazz nut. So he had this huge record collection, everything from like Coltrane Miles, but he also liked Stevie Wonder 
and Johnny Guitar Watson. Wow. So like Shaka Khan, like early Rufus stuff. So like he would play that and he always listened to it really loud. And my mom would always complain, like, turn that down. And I, I remember just like, oh, yeah, this is cool. You know, so all this music that then I later discovered again when I started playing bass, it was like, oh, yeah, this stuff is great. You yeah, know, this is the stuff I love. This is the stuff I already loved. Like, you know, when I still played like air guitar, but I was also into ACDC. I was big into ACDC. So like my taste was always already at an early age. I think my taste was pretty broad you know even without me really knowing it because i was 12 13 and then when i was 14 i started playing bass and then you know all the summers i was living in two different worlds so living in europe at that time also meant i really got into the police and the specials because that stuff was you know punk had already sort of happened but it was like the late 70s early 80s so I was really into the police, like the first two police records. And then I started playing bass. And the reason I started playing bass is because one friend played guitar and another friend played drums. And so it was like, well, you got to play the bass. You know, we need to. And I was like, OK. And, you know, I was the tall, lanky one. I was like, OK, I'll try the bass because I wanted to hang out, you know. So I was like, I want a bass. First, I had like an Ibanez, like really crappy Ibanez bass because they were like, oh, he's not, probably not going to stick with this. And I remember my stepdad got me a Fender jazz bass that I still have, and it was a mid-70s. I thought the Fender jazz bass looked cool or something. And so I got that. When you first got rolling, did you start trying to dig into records? How did that go? Yeah, I mean, f yeah, at first it was sort of like I just like learned on my own and with my buddies. And the guy, the guitar player kid that I was playing with, he was super talented, and he somehow just had a knack. So he would show me stuff. And then, yeah, we would listen to records and, like, I remember sort of one of the first things I learned was, like, like, Hey Joe, you know, because it wasn't that hard. But then learning that do-do-do-do-do-do-do, that, like, walking figure at the end yeah. that kicks in, you know, was, like, what big deal when I learned that or Purple Haze, you know. Those were some of the early, because we were trying to jam that stuff, you know. Uh -huh. Like, Hendrix was big and my stepdad hit me to Hendrix because... We were listening to ACDC and all this other stuff. He's like, you need to check out, you know. My stepdad was pretty hip, you know, and he had a great record collection. So I remember he brought us this Jimi Hendrix record and was like, whoa. You know, and he would have these hangs with his buddies and they'd sit around and listen to Coltrane and Miles and Oscar Peterson Trio. And, you know, so I would hear that stuff too. But then he'd be like, oh, you know, he put on like a James Taylor record or because he liked, he liked soulful music or he put on like a Shaka record or... Stevie Wonder he was a big fan of, you know. At any point, did you ever actually finally sit down with someone? Like, did you Yes, take... then I started taking some lessons. Yeah, That's like, right. did, you, did you feel like there's stuff going on, I don't know how to quite connect it? Like, totally. It, that was Absolutely, a feeling, you're like, I, yeah. need, I need more information. Yes, I need more information. So there was this local hero over there who was like this super, he could play all this like Jocko type stuff and he was into weather report. And so I would go to his house, you know, but I was super nervous and like, he would start showing me, you know, scales and what I needed to practice. And yeah. it was intimidating. It was like, oh, no, like, this is work, you know. Like, mm -hmm. I was never, like, a great practicer. Like, I didn't, I mean, I no, that's not true. I take that back. I did practice a lot when I was young. And then especially, like, in college and stuff. Because then I moved back to the States, you know. And I spent all my summers with my dad. And then I went out there and my dad showed me this campus out in California. It was, like, palm trees and sunshine i was like okay germany or winter in california germany or <laughs> you know and playing music and and he knew the head of this music program because my dad was a college professor what school was it it was san jose state university it was a big state school down in san jose about you know 45 minutes south of oakland i think the most profound thing for me was really the summer spent in oakland because my dad lived around the corner from a blues club like a real deal blues uh, club. Which one? It was called Kesey's Lounge, Your um, Place. Is it, it still on, there? Or? No, it burned down one summer. I arrived and my dad was like, I have bad news. Kesey's burned down. Mm -hmm. I was like devastated because that was like for a couple summers, all I would do is hang out at this club, work for the club owner, passing out flyers and putting up posters around Berkeley and Oakland. And he had some, you know, 
John Lee Hooker played there. So you had, Lowell you had Folsom, top level international he, guys. He, yeah, kind of, no, but the blues scene was really big in the Bay Area at that These time, are, early '80s. There was a club called Eli's Mile High Club that I ended up going to a bunch, and it was fascinating because I had discovered through Hendrix and rock and roll. You know, my dad was like, "Well, you need to know where this music came from." So my dad then like hit me to, you know, BB King and John Lee Hooker and and and. And we would go see B.B. King. Like, I remember I saw B.B. King when I was, like, 16. And I remember meeting him after the gig because he, you know, he was known to come out of, out into the audience after shows. And I remember he, I went up to him and he gave me a guitar pick. But so suddenly blues music became really big for me. And, and it was also something that I could grasp, you know, sort of like, it was like, it felt really good. And my dad lived around the corner from this club. So I actually met, Lowell Fulson and John Lee Hooker and I was this kid from around the corner and my dad went over and met Lewis the owner he was like yeah your son he can come in here anytime you know because they had a kitchen so and I was tall I wasn't really supposed to be in there but somehow how I got involved was their guitar player lived right across the street from my dad's house in Oakland his name was Carl Robinson and he was this lefty guitar player and he would always sit out on his stoop, and I'd say, Dad, there's this guy sitting out on the stoop playing guitar. And he goes, go meet him. You know, go over there and tell him you play too. And so I sauntered across the street, and I met this guy, Carl Robinson. He was great, real deal blues player, you know, was playing a lot of bands. And then he invited me to the Sunday Jam, the barbecue back door, backyard Kesey's Lounge Jam that was open to, you know, in the afternoon to families and stuff. He's like, yeah, you should come down to the jam, man. I was like, okay. <laughs> and I remember going down there, and they were playing, like, shuffles, and it was, like, the real thing. And suddenly, like, you know, I had been listening to the B.B. King record. Suddenly, here it was happening on a local level. Yeah. It's such a different thing when you and finally so see it And it was so real, and it was like, I was like, oh, my God. And then I met Lowell Folson, and it, like, all started coming together for me, like, and I loved the shuffle, and I met this bass player. His name was Willie Mays. He also lived a couple blocks away. And he, I'll never forget, man, I, I, went, I went into the club and I listened to him and he played the shuffle and it was like life-changing for me because it was so powerful. You know, it was like... And he was just rocking it so hard and the drummer was playing the shuffle and all of a sudden it was like these records that I heard, it was happening right here around the corner from my dad's house. And I was really lucky to have that yeah. experience, you know? Well, it's and really it, had, it had such an impact on me. And so I would start buying all these blues records and then bring them back to Germany and play them for my German buddies. Uh, so this, is, they this were like, is even before, so this is all before college. Yeah, oh yeah, this is as a <clears throat> teenager, you know? That's so great. And so I would spend all my summers there and my dad would let me stay there till like midnight. You know, I was like a teenager. And you could literally, from my dad's house, when the club door would open at night and people would sort of saunter out into the streets, you could hear like, you know, like way in the distance. <laughs> like a movie. You know? So I could just walk there. It was a half a block away on Telegraph Avenue and 65th Street in Oakland. And it was a profound, it was, it was the most sort of profound thing that happened to me musically as a kid i mean i didn't know like then like oh this is what i'm gonna end up doing you know it still seemed sort of because i had the other voices like you know my mom was more like well that's all good and well hobby and was that part of the decision to actually go study at university or was yeah, it yeah it was like i was just like well maybe there's a way that i can do this somehow but it was still very remote so when you went to the university did you study music or did yeah you i did something? i ended up studying music but like i really came in with almost no knowledge of theory or but I was, was it mostly jazz they were teaching there? Or? Yeah, it was like jazz. So I got into jazz, you know. So suddenly I was like into, you know, I did get into jazz. But I sort of realized quickly that, and I think this is what helped me later when I moved to New York, is that I really liked jazz a lot. And I'd been around it with my stepdad and my dad too. Because they all had jazz records that they would listen to. And I tried learning it. But it was like, I don't know, maybe it was because I wasn't a great student. I was always more like a doer as opposed to like, you know, yeah. I wasn't great. I wasn't great academically because I felt like I got all the other stuff, you know, from hanging at the blues club. Yeah. And the, I mean, because that really had an impact just 
for the feel of the music and the atmosphere that that music thrives in, yeah. like the blues club down at the corner and, you know, people drinking and dancing and like, you know, but then actually having to learn music, it was challenging, you know, and I wasn't a great student, you know, because I was always late for my morning because I was playing, I started playing in blues bands. Mm -hmm. The whole blues thing had a really powerful effect on me and I wanted to like play blues. Mm. Like I loved it. And so I was like, I wanted to play shuffles and I wanted to play funky blues, like, you know, yeah, like, you know, Albert King stuff or like, and then that led me into the whole James Brown soul music stacks, you know, mm. came from listening to all this blues music. Cause like, that was like a funkier version of the blues, you know, totally but with songs. Cause I also liked songs. So I don't know. It was, every, it was just, everything was wide open. It was like a, I liked it all, and in some ways it was confusing because it's like, well, I'm learning jazz, but I like this, and I still like some ACDC, and I still like listening to those police records. And yeah, I came to New York, like, I don't know how, I, like, nowadays when I think about it, like, the fact that I had the courage to do it. Well, this friend of mine who was a Berkeley dropout came to New York, and he was like, man, come to New York. And I was like, okay. You know, I was like, I'm going to go to New York. And I don't know, I just, I, 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 I left the Bay Area. I came to New York City. You know, I was like, I'm going to check it out because I have a buddy there. And New York was exciting. And just to go back, like, so I'd spent one summer here with this friend of mine because his father was a musician and knew all these artists that had lofts. So I lived in a loft down in, uh, in like, near Little Italy, near Canal Street. And I remember we would, like, go see the lounge lizards in the east in, in, on Avenue A or Avenue C at 8 BC. I remember seeing the lounge lizards and like walking through Tompkins Square Park in like 85, 86. And it was like... It's another world. It's out. another world. Like it was dangerous, but we wanted to go see the lounge lizards, you know? So I remember seeing this weird avant-garde like lounge lizards music, you know? Mm -hmm. It was fascinating. So like I got a New York bug. So I think because I had been here a few times it was sort of not so remote, like it was doable. Like, oh, I've been to New York and now I have a friend there. Yeah. And New York's like so much cool music. You know, I had all these records that were like, you know, Atlantic and it was like New York City. It's the place. It's the place, you know. And at that time, I'd imagine this would be like early, late 80s, early 90s? I moved to New York in 1990. Okay. The winter of 1990. So you got to still a lot of, a lot of heroes are still playing today, but oh, so yeah. many were playing out in the clubs. Totally. Every night. Like, I remember going to see Hiram Bullock, you know, play at the club at Mikkel's. And, you know, here, like, and then suddenly I knew some people that, like, were playing with him because I yeah. met these other Berkeley people. Because I didn't go to Berkeley, but, you know, like Steve Wolf. Yeah, and Delome. Like, and, and Delome and those guys. I got to know them through some other Berkeley people that were in town, even though I had no connection to Berkeley. But, you know, suddenly, like, yeah, like, I, I met Steve Logan, incredible mm. bass player who's since passed away. But he was, like, had a profound, of you know, impact on me because I remember seeing him with David Sanborn because I ended up being a Marcus Miller fan. And then I remember going to see David Sanborn, but Marcus wasn't on the gig, but this guy Steve Logan was. And, I remember, and Hiram, you know, and mm. I was like, man, these guys are playing some funky, you know, even though... I don't know, it could be considered fusion, but they were rooted in but blues it was more and rooted soul in music. Yeah, totally. So like suddenly like, man, Marcus Miller and Hiram. And then I got to New York and those guys were around, you know. And then this guy, Steve Logan, that I saw in Berkeley with Sanborn, suddenly like I got met him mm -hmm. in New York and it was like, oh, I'm hanging out with like Steve Logan. And, yeah. and there's this guy, Steve Wolf, who's like this amazing drummer. And they were playing with Hiram and I'd go to the clubs and, Suddenly, like, I was like, I think I could maybe be in this world, you know, or yes. I could be, maybe I could be good enough to, you know, play and, with these kind of dudes. And, you know, I was like the nude guy. And I remember going to blues jams, like at Manny's Car Wash and down on Bleecker Street. And, you know, I was like, I want to get a gig here. Like, yeah. And, and was that was a special time, like, because that's before my time in New York. But right, you I saw the tail end of it. But you guys came because I met you like in maybe 97 or 98. Yeah. Was that when I met you guys? Like you and, and we Ethan. saw the, like the tail end of, of that. that thing that you guys who are just were here a little sooner than we were going. That, like when there was 
you could play seven nights a week, four oh, sets totally. a night. Totally, and I did. You know, yeah. I really did. I was down on Bleecker Street. I remember getting my first gigs, and Bill Sims is one of the first early guys that I played with. I tracked down Steve Logan, and I wanted to get lessons, take lessons from Steve. So I did, and Steve and I would sort of more just hang out and. I'd listen to him play and I'd go watch him play. And he was like really, he had a real impact on me, man, the way yeah. he played because he was grooving and he just had such a unique way of playing the bass. Like what was he this? was funky and like rootsy and, and would play these interesting lines and it was all bubbly and it was like stuff that I liked. And I don't know, it was just, yeah, sitting with Steve. And then I started subbing for Steve so on he the started Bill Sims to help gig. You get, yeah. Because Steve, like, took a liking to me and was like, yeah, man, you got the feel, man, you know. Like, Steve kind of, confer- like, he was like, yeah, you got the feel, man, you know. You, you keep, you know, you got to, you know, but you got to get more of this kind of, like, you know, theory and, like, some, you know, a little more technique together, you know, because I was really raw, you know. Mm-hmm. In these times, was it a combination of getting to play with some of the, you know some of the hero drummers or was it was did you find it in in your friends that you were playing with in the scene at that time or was it a combination like what were some of the most important moments of finding those relationships with the drummers and mm-hmm. rhythm section and building rhythm sections you know it was just being out on the scene and like you know sometimes it wasn't a choice like bill had this drummer that played with him and he would have different guys that would come through and you know and then sometimes it was like you maybe wouldn't relate to the drummer or you just try to make it work you know what were some of those like then it gradually becomes like how do you make things work even if you don't maybe have a natural connection Mm -hmm. and what was what were some of those first really strong connections whether it's like you felt like you found kind of a brother in in the groove or you found kind of like a, a mentor in the groove one of the guys I played was I, I played with the singer Frankie Paris, who was sort of an R and B blues singer, really great singer, and he had this drummer in his group, and I ended up getting the gig. His name was Crusher Green, mm, and he sure. played with Wilson Pickett forever. Yeah, and he was a real deal like shuffle R and B show drummer, you know. He could do the big fills, and he could break it down with. He had the kick drum thing, and. He was the real thing. And so I remember playing with him and it was like, wow. You know, and he would tell me, he's like, yeah, I just got back from the Wilson Pickett tour, you know, and then we'd be at Dan Lynch Blues Bar. But then playing shuffle with him was like incredible. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh my God, like this is the real thing, you know? Or I remember guys like this in Oakland at the Blues Club that played like that. It was a real, it was a thing. It was like, these guys that really came up with that music and came from that sort of place, you know? And so getting to connect with that. But then, you know, I would meet people like me that were out searching for something. Like, I remember I was playing with these two guys, the Petty Brothers, and that's how I met my friend Tony Mason, who I ended up playing a lot with in the early days. And we had this session down here on 13th Street and those guys were into jazz, but they also wanted to play some groovy stuff. And I remember Tony and I immediately had this connection. You know, he had such a nice feel. And I was like, man, I like this guy. So then I recommended him for Bill Sims. I was like, you know, when I would like, Bill, man, you got to get this guy on the drums, you know. But yeah, there were some just great drummers. And some guys I just ended up because I got asked to do the gig and then whoever the drummer was, was the drummer. But there were a lot of great players down on Bleecker Street. Say if you're, you're going to do a new gig and you get the material, yeah. like do you have a process that you've kind of refined that helps you? Because in, yes. in New York it can get crazy when you're playing 10, 15 people's oh my gigs. God. Yeah, I mean, you trying learn to a- memorize stuff, you know. I mean, for me, the process would be I would get the whatever, let's say 20 songs. I would listen to it. I would realize like, oh, those aren't going to be that hard. These are going to be a little trickier. And what I would start to do is write out chord charts. Mm-hmm. And you write bar them lines, yeah. you know, so that I could see it, you know, and I started learning about like, oh, you know, and, and really like memorizing, okay, you know, this verse is 16 bars, but then the second one's only eight. And then seeing it on paper helped me, like, put it in my head. When you write these kind of charts, because you see everybody's different shorthand for doing these things. Yeah, my charts are, yours, are like, are my understood? charts are like, you maybe you wouldn't get what, yeah, you know, okay. like, it's not, I'm not great at making, like, you know, like. It's your system. 
I ha- but it's a system that works for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, or I'd rem- I'd memorize the main bass line. Mm-hmm. You know, like this is the really important line in the verse. You got to play this bass line. Yeah. If you're gonna play this tune, you got to play the bass line note for note. Mm-hmm. But then when the solo happens, then you can start to make it your own. Mm-hmm. But then you got to come back to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, or there's critical bass lines. You know, then I really got into John Paul Jones and I did this Zeppelin cover gig. So suddenly I had to learn all this like really good. It was challenging, you know, because he was busy. You know, he was like the James Jamerson of rock. You know, yeah. You know, because he did all that busy sort of Motown, but he put it into a hard rock sort of you know rock and roll context. Yeah, totally. So I started to learn like you know the Lemon Song or like you know Led Zeppelin. I loved that stuff, but that was challenging. Because sometimes the bass is hard to hear because there's all this other stuff happening. Yeah, totally, totally. And I was like, man, what's he doing there? Is that a? I can't tell if it's a flat seven or a six. You know, like because it's going by so fast and there's all this other stuff happening. And, yeah. You know, so it's a process that you learn. You start to figure out. You really get inside, or and it's re- repetition. Yeah, you know, listening to a song over and over, and playing along with it over and over again, until it's like, because you can learn a bunch of music at home, but as you know, Steve, from in, you know, being a guitar player and working a million gigs, you might know it at home playing along with the record, but when you got to bring it to the gig, yeah, and then you have to just you're on your own, you know, you're not playing along with the yeah. record. And especially And you're playing with other guys that are also learning the music and how they interpret it. Yeah. Or you know, do do they feel it the way the record feels and you know, so there's all these things that come into play, like, you know, playing well with others and like how are they feeling it and what did they learn and how come it's not feeling the same as when I played along with the record at home? Well, I'm not playing with Roger Hawkins or Bernard Purdy. Yeah. That could be one thing. Yeah. But I'm probably also not <laughs> that's, playing that's it crazy as good talk. as you know, <laughs> I'm probably also not playing it like Chuck Rainey and maybe other people are wondering why it's not feeling you know, we're all we're young and we were learning and we were studying these records and Everyone was trying to figure it out, but then it would come together. Like Tony and I would lock into some groove and be like, yeah, man, we're doing it. Yeah. You know, this feels like the record, you know, or, you know, we play like some Bill Withers tune or we'd play, you know, staple singers. I'll take you there with a singer at a club. And we'd be like, man, yeah, we really learned that, you know, Tony, the little clickety clack Roger Hawkins thing. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and suddenly it's like, yeah, we can do this, you know, like. And did that? No, it was exciting. You know, it's like you because you know. I mean, it's in your really early twenties. You're still like figuring stuff out. And this is either when I first moved to New York or right before I moved to New York. I had come down to Terra Blues. I saw you. A bit, it was a Bill gig. It's first time I ever saw Bill Sims play. Yeah, I played was, with Bill at Terra all the time. So it was you, Tony, Bruce Flowers was playing keyboards. Yes, Bruce and amazing Bill, keyboard player. And I honestly, and I had gone down with Bruce, who was a bud, and I just sat there watching this thing go down and going like, I don't know what I'm getting myself into here because I had, I'd never heard. It was still like playing tunes, but it might as well have been going to see Wilson Pickett or Bill Weathers or BB yeah, King. Because Bill like, is so wonderful. And but you the, know? the way you guys were playing, it was just, it was just another few levels more refined and so that was so interesting to see that it mm-hmm. really inspired me oh that's, and, that's cool and, and scared me a little bit honestly but in a good way in a good way like it like, was like i can do that too. i gotta dig I wanna, in i want to dig that in and do that yeah i can do that but then on the other side so that's one thing but then the playing with artists thing that bill's an incredible artist but playing original an original artist thing that's another thing and then i remember coming and seeing you a little while after and you were playing with jill cypher that's right uh yep. i was married to for years that's um, right with dan and doug petty dan and doug and tony and tony yeah that and was and then the group. to see the same rhythm section plus those guys who were uh, they were I the never, petty brothers were and incredible. this was another thing of seeing and they're both incredible musicians these guys you know can play these classic R&B soul tunes, but then they can take their musicianship and come up with stuff around original music and play it with such confidence where it was, you know, gigging the bitter end. But I'd never, I had never seen people deal with original music that wasn't already something famous on that level and how you guys were making choices where Dan switching to the right guitar and the right sound and 
you and Tony had figured out how to play these really complicated songs, but make them make them feel make them super. But I think easy. that's not was, that far apart. Like you know, when you because I mean R and B and blues is about the song in a way yeah. too. You know, and so the process parts. the process is the same. For I you. think the yeah, I think so. I think it's not that far. You know, because you know, uh, like especially from a bass standpoint. I mean, when you're learning a staple singer song or an Otis Redding song. That's like, you know, learning someone else's original singer songwriter project. It's all connected, you know. Mm-hmm. It's it's about the song, it's about the singer. So, you know, when I would start doing those kind of gigs, it's like, yeah, you're supporting make it feel good and and it's around it's about the song. It's about mm-hmm. the artist. You know, you're you're there as a as a support role and and it's something that I always enjoyed. Yeah. So it's not about any one individual. Like, check out my thing, and I'm going to play this crazy fill, or like, it's you not kind jazz. Of, you've you kind know? of always had that, like that yeah, restraint, like it, that it, taste. It, yeah. Like I, I wanted to. So like, I, I sort of naturally took to the whole singer songwriter scene because I didn't see it as being that different. You know, it's it. It was you know like Freddie Johnston. I mean, he's coming more from you know. Uh, a folk thing but to me it was all connected it was still soulful songs you know really nice melodies and the music you've gone on to play are so rooted in the music you were first inspired by whether right, like when i played with joan she was coming from like you know joan i played with joan osborne for about a year or so and toured with her and she's totally i mean she came up in, around the same time that i came up here you know in the 90s she was playing all the blues clubs because she was coming from a blues yeah thing and so then i ended up on her gig and it all made sense to me you know even though she was doing you know it was blues it was sort of blues and soul music influenced but she was doing her own music you know and then she had a big hit and but it was all to me it's all sort of the same like in a, in a way you know yeah. like there's not that yeah freedy johnston is not like otis redding music but yeah. But there's parallels, you know. Mm-hmm. It's about the melody, the song, expressing a you know, feeling, you know, about the lyrics. Yeah. You have a way of when necessary, you can fill the space up, but then you can also air it out. And it's like, it's interesting because you've played with so many guitar players that are just incredible guitar players and, and often in trios sometimes. Yeah, it was super challenging. And that that was a big challenge for me, playing in a trio. Is it about like how to, where the... How to fill that space, you know, because in a trio, I mean, and I, I, you know, like I love the Jimi Hendrix experience and I love Cream and... Would you guys talk about that stuff? Like when you're playing with Michael Landau or when you're playing with Robin, are you guys talking about... Not really, it's more just, no, there's less, it's more learn the songs groove and fill the space and it also then depends on the drummer you know like how busy is the drummer is the drummer more on the busy side is he, is he more on the sparse side how do i fit in am i going to be busier am i going to play longer notes am i going to try to fill more space because there is no keyboard because then once the guitar player starts soloing it's just you, you know, you have to play with a certain authority and really know the song, mm-hmm. you know, because if you get lost, there's no one else there. There's not a second guitar player. There's not, it's just the drums. Mm-hmm. It's very naked. So it's a process to figure out, you know, playing with a trio is not an easy thing as a bass player because I want it to sound full, but it's only up to me in a way. You know, if the guitar isn't playing rhythm, if the guitar player isn't playing rhythm and singing, that's one thing. But then when, if it's guitar-based music and they start playing solo, then it's just, you know, it's like it's a lot of space to fill. Mm-hmm. And you have to figure out how to approach that and how to, you know, how little or how how much to play, you know. And it's a process, I mean, you know. What are some of the most uh, valuable lessons like you've learned from getting to be around some of these guys? Like I'm sure it's different with each person, like, and how they deal with themselves. And well, I would think like both with Robin Ford or with Mike Landau, like those guys have also done a lot of time being sidemen, playing with yes, other artists. Exactly. Where, Very much you know, so. and, and John Schofield in his own way, but not in a much different way, playing as a jazz artist. Yeah, much like, right in that way. That's you know, true. or with Warren Haynes, like. Or with, yeah. the, you know, with Rich Robinson and Oddly, like... The one thing that really... St- the first thing that comes to mind when you ask me that question is that 
all those guys are really great soloists, world class, really incredible, expressive, and beautiful, but they all are really good rhythm guitar players. And that sometimes you'll run across people that are maybe really good soloists, but they don't comp that well or don't play rhythm that well, or can really have like some texture about them and fill out the space, you know? And those guys all, like Robin's incredible rhythm guitar player and Mike Landau's unbelievable as well. And they both have like a thing where like just their approach and their texture and their sound is, it's big, you know, without even being, I mean, they can get loud, but they're dynamic too, you know. It's and bigger can, than it it's is It's a loud. big sound, but it's not necessarily all about volume. So, I mean, that's the one takeaway is like that they're great rhythm players too. So when you're playing, when you're, you know, locking into a nice feel with the drummer, they're also just playing great time, you know. And even if they're soloing, they're hearing that great time. Oh, yeah, so it's totally. And that's why what makes them also just great soloists because they have a good time sense, you know. And they can weave in and out and bend it a little bit, but their basic pulse is so great. You're still feeling that when they're soloing, you know. A lot of those guys don't tell you what to do. Well, you're there because they already... They sort of trust they, that yeah, you'll... That's why you're there. That you're trying to go... For, they, they, you either do the, either you'll, you'll play what's, mm. what's needed, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Well, they trust you or you wouldn't be there. Yeah, they sort of trust you or you wouldn't be there. And so you have to sort of trust that you're there for that reason too, even if maybe you're not feeling... You know, I've been in situations with those guys. Like, you know, there's part of me that feels sort of like, how did I get here? You know, where I, where I feel like, because I mean, when I got to play with Robin Ford or John Schofield, it was like, are you kidding me? Like, I mean, I grew up listening to those guys. Yeah. Like, they were heroes. They were like larger than life, you know? Like, I had that first Robin Ford record, you know? I had Hissing of Summer Lawns, you know, Joni Mitchell, Robin Ford. You know, when I got it, had that whole phase and got into that kind of, you know, I was really into Joni Mitchell because of the Jocko thing on Hijira and, mm -hmm. you know, the Mingus cover record that she did. And so then suddenly, you know, oh, Robin Ford plays with Joni Mitchell and, and you know, or, or he played with George Harrison, you know? And he played with Miles Davis and I saw Miles with Sco and like, it was just like, and to suddenly like be in a room with those guys and actually be at that moment where like I might play with these guys and then I did it was it was, it was heavy you know, it was also really intimidating because those guys are really I mean that's a whole nother topic but like you know I've had I've been pretty confident but it's also easy to feel really like oh my god am I up to this how do you manage it when it's in the moment of like do you just I mean yeah I'd have to remind myself okay they're asking me to play for a reason. They could call any, some, a bunch of other dudes, but they're asking me to play or do this gig or do this tour. You know, like I remember auditioning for just John, you know, and I was like, I'm not going to ever get that gig. I'm not good enough for that. Like John Schofield is like, you know, he's a genius. I'm not a, I can't play jazz. You know, like he's going to know right away that I, I can't hang. But the project that I auditioned for for him was something actually was sort of more my strength he was looking for something that just felt really good and was grooving you know it was this project called the uber jam band it wasn't it wasn't so much it's not like playing giant steps or you know has a million changes you know he does that in other groups where he plays jazz you know yeah. but the uber jam thing was more about funk and soul music with some electronic you know with avi playing rhythm guitar and triggering loops and samples and it was more like, in a way, like I approached that gig like early Bootsy, you know, that like or bubbly doo-doo, doo you know. Yeah. And there'd be some cool little changes and Sko would play this class, you know, like his in that sound that he has, that wonderful, that's so, you, you know, him playing that sound and playing those melodies. And it was a groove thing, you know. And so I did fit in, but it was, you know, because I remember seeing the Blue Matter band in college like 
I was playing in a, in a blues band with a drummer that grew up with Dennis Chambers. And he's like, man, you want to go see Schofield tonight? And I was like, yeah, because I was really into the blue matter. You know, Gary Granger, all that slapping and those like powerful, funky grooves. You know, it's like, and I remember seeing it. And to think that like, you know, 15 years later, I'd be auditioning for Schofield in New York. It was like, you, I, if you would have told me that back then, I would have been like, you're crazy. That's never going to happen to me. You know, I mean, I had confidence, but I was never like, oh, I'm great and I'm going to do great things. I just sort of try to just play as good as I could and, and keep your head down and keep my head down <laughs> and like learn the music and, and play well with others and try to have really good time. You know, I've definitely practiced with a metronome a lot and played along with a lot of records and studied feels like, why does this feel good? And how can I fit into that and playing along with the records for hours? That's sort of what I did. You know? Like if someone's getting into the shuffle, for instance, yeah. like do you just put on some shuffles and play with some shuffles and hope for the yeah. best? Yeah. Or does it get... Is How it, do you do mean? You, like if I'm teaching someone? Or if, if, you're, if you're some guy at home and you're like, I want to get into some shuffles... I think shift. it's like, like, yeah, putting on the records, like going to the source, you know? And, and how do you... Putting on B.B. King Live at the Regal and playing along with and, like... And maybe you just had, I don't know how to say it, almost like you were able to just maybe intuitively tell if you were if you were there. Like sometimes you could be, you could put on a shuffle and play with the shuffle for a long time, but you're still not playing the shuffle with the shuffle. Like if... Sure, like, yeah. I mean, if, yeah, if, if, like if somehow you, it's a it's a feel that's challenging for mm. you it like could, did you refine it like i guess that's what i'm trying to get to it's it's really hard to say I mean, like, that feel came natural to me only because i was i you know my my dad lived around the corner from a blues yeah. club and i was really young and i was into those records suddenly i saw it happening right in front of me yeah and, and you get to play with some of the and dudes then i got who to could play really with some of those guys at these jams you know as a kid and they would show me how to do it you know so if like you say you're say you're someone who's getting into this music and you love it and you're really excited about it, like what are what are some of those what are like a few of the main like those archetypal grooves you got to get together you got to get together, like when you think of a shuffle is a shuffle a shuffle, do you think do you I mean, think there's it, all kinds different kinds you know yeah like what are some of the for someone who wouldn't know like what are the like for some young bass players you know they've only maybe heard some. I don't know, Freddie King record, like Hideaway. That's or, good. Freddie yeah. King, that's that's a great place to start right there. Yeah. You, know, you listen to his early instrumental records and then his later stuff. I mean, that's, yeah, like you would listen to that and you try to, you know, emulate it. You try mm. to copy it. You know, what's the bass player doing? Yeah. You know, Should, why is he doing that? Like learning what's those, the drummer doing? Learning those key early patterns, yeah, like a like, walking shuffle. Yeah, just a walking, like, a, like just like a basic... Doom, 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 Willie doom, Dixon, doom, like... Yeah, Willie Dixon, exactly. You know, Muddy Waters records, BB King records. What's the bass player doing? What's he doing? Why does it feel good? Why is he playing bass with them? Yeah. You know, what's he doing that, you know, wow, this feels really good, you know? Or this is moving me in a... I mean, it has to speak to you. Yeah. You know, I mean, we all have different come up... I mean, I, I mean, I feel I was lucky. I was exposed to a lot of different kind of music. And But like, you know, you might come up as a kid only listening to prog rock and then that's your feeling. You have to like you have to like what you like and then just sort of like that feels good to me. I want to know about that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to keep listening to and I would listen to those records to death, you know? And like I would listen to it on my headphones even away from the instrument and then I would try to emulate like copy that feel like without even note for note but just like what does this feel like why is this feeling so good? You know, what's the drummer doing that makes that bass feel so good and like Oh, there's the space. Oh, why is Bootsy leaving so much space? He's leaving all these holes. Oh, maybe that's why it feels so good. You know, the what he's not playing. Hmm. You know, what he decides to leave out or how he slightly changes the pattern right before going to the bridge. He does this little walk-up thing. Oh, what do you do there? And the drummer did this thing. And, like, it's really just studying and listening over and over. I think that's the key. And what speaks to you? Like, you have to like it. You know, you have to love it. You have to like it. And it has to be like, that speaks to me. That feels good to me. You know, that music feels good to me. And whatever that is, it's cool. Like, there's no one thing better than the other. Yeah. You know, if you really are into Yes, and you like Chris Squire, and that really speaks to you, and you want to do that, that's great. 
get into that yeah. and be totally into it and play like that and play with a pick and that's beautiful it's great you know mm-hmm. i think it's you have to just trust what what do you like what do you like and how you know like i want to do that you know mm-hmm. like and i and that's what i was saying earlier like when i moved to new york i realized very quickly like i'm not going to be a jazz guy i knew it i got here You know, I went and heard jazz. I already was trying to study it in San Jose. And I learned some standards. And, and, you know, I can fake my way through a standard. But it's not my strong suit, you know. It just helps make you more well-rounded, some of that knowledge. When but you, having when you need some it. of that, yeah, totally. And, yeah. I, and I'll put on a Miles Davis record, and I'll, I love it, you know. And Yeah, totally. And, I'm, you know, I'm, and I I'm, love Ray Brown. Like, he's one of my all-time favorite yeah. upright bass players. And a groover. Groover, man, just and I went and I would go see Ray Brown, even though I don't play upright. But I would sit there and listen to him go, "Oh my god, this is, <laughs> this is like so funky!" Like it was funky to me, yeah. but like ACDC's funky to me. Yeah. You know, there's like a certain when I say funky, it's like it can be not just James Brown funk, but like you know, BB King's funky, even if it's there's shuffle. A ba- there's a bounce to there's it. There's just a bounce, a feeling to it. And it's the music that just spoke to me. Or like listening to reggae music. Like I really got into Family Man because that was so grooving, you know. Mm. It was all the space or, you know, or the way Sting played bass with the police, you know. Yeah. He sort of had that reggae influence and it was kind of rock and roll punkish thing. And he would leave all the space and that was a trio too. And how'd they get that big sound? Andy Summers with those big chords. And, you know, this is a really sad sort of song. Like, okay... You want to play some long, you know, play it as sad as you can play it. You know, maybe play really long notes or play really sparse or play a little, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not making any sense. You're making, but, you're making total but sense. You bring that to the other thing. And so I always just brought... Like with your energy, the way, like I noticed, like you've got a way, like I always, every time we play music together, I feel like... You're like bending the time, like it's like moving energy. Like, like yeah, sometimes like you want to build some. Like, I feel like you think to, when I'm playing and you're supporting me, it's like you're like an energy mover. It's like I'm gonna move the energy forward now, and now I'm gonna yeah, pull totally. it back. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and you can have that power to do and that. You can and really, you gotta pick at the right moments. You know? Yeah, but and that's, sometimes it's hit or miss, and it's through trial and error. Yeah, it's you know, amazing. Like, it's about dynamics and like what's everyone else doing and like. I totally agree with you. It, you. Yeah, as a bass player, you are like an energy mover. It's Especially like, in combination with the drums. Like, when are we going to get... Oh, suddenly we're going to get quiet. Or like... It's really about just having your ears open. And it's... You know, and a lot of it's hit or miss and trial and error. And, you know, you try things. And, oh, that didn't work. Okay, next time I'll maybe not... Maybe there I push too hard. It's all about, like, gathering information... Mm-hmm and knowing the people you're playing with and how they play like how to you know like i love the bending the time thing because ethan's so great at that yeah you know he's so like i can sort of like it's like rubber bandish with him and it's never it's not like it ever drags or rushes but it just it moves like it's a feeling like it's hard to you know like he and i sometimes and i have that with tony mason too like we're just like it feels so good, you know, or they just, or they know my playing, or, and I, and the, and here's the, and that, and while we're talking about that, I think the listening thing, it has to really be on a deep level, like where you're really, it's not just about you. Like, how are you connecting with the other people? You know, like really having, like listening, like, and I could tell when I play, like, drummers, man, when they're really, like a non-selfish way of playing you know because of course we're like okay what am i doing of course that's naturally your but very quickly it has to be what's the group doing what's this song about what's the feeling of this what's the energy of this tune you know when does it shift when does it move a little bit when does it breathe a little when does it come back down when does it go back up it's like are all these subtleties, you know? And I think as time you gather all this information and the, all your experiences and all the different people you play with, and then you sort of figure your thing out and what your voice is and how you play. You know, uh, does that make sense? 
That makes total sense. I mean, <laughs> it's it's not easy. It's hard to put in words, but that was pretty good. But I think everyone ha- can can relate. Like anyone who's been doing it for a while knows what I'm talking about. You know. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think it's following your gut instinct and like, what is it that I like? What feels good to me? And how can I make that happen? And who are the people that I want to surround myself with, you know? And, you know, when I play with guys like Mike or Sko or any of those guys or even like Freddie Johnson or like the Black Crows, like people that are really great at what they do, you know, how can I fit into this? And what's needed from me, you know? To, to support this and make this, you know, with the Black Crows thing, it was really loud and it was rock and roll, but, you know, I love Led Zeppelin, so Black Crows was like, okay, I, I, you know, and the Black Crows, they love, you know, they're coming from blues. I mean, their first big hit was an Otis Redding cover. So, okay, they like what I like. So, boom, right there. And I remember thinking, like, when their second record came out, I was like, man, I want to be in a band like that. And then I ended up in that band for a year and a half. It was crazy, like, you know, I mean, for me, definitely some dreams came true. And sometimes to my surprise, where it's like, how did this happen? Like, I, you know, so sometimes, you know, I, I, I mean, and, and this is something that I think all musicians struggle with. And I think it's a real topic is like, because sometimes when you're young, you're sort of reckless. And sometimes that's really great because you're not so in your head. You're just Oh, I love to play and play, play, play. But as you learn and you become a professional and you have all these experiences, then there's also this pressure to be like, oh, like I got to be a certain way or I got to play this right so they think I'm good or or maybe I should play more. Or like, is my part interesting enough? You know, then there's all this psychological thing that starts to, you know, or you start comparing yourself to others that are on the scene or people that you look up to that are, maybe doing something that you wish you were doing, but they're doing it. And, you know, you start comparing yourself and the, there's a whole psychological thing too, you know, it's, and it's just, so I think it's important to, to find what it is that you like and build on whatever your strengths are. And what do you have, what do you have to do as a bass player to make a living and to get called, you know? And it's not just playing, it's also your personality, how you relate to people, your attitude. I mean, there's so many factors that come into play. And I think there's also just a lot, I've had a lot of luck. I mean, it's not all luck either. Like, well, you know, I got luck. into those situations because I had something, but sometimes I couldn't even figure out, like, wow, how did I get here? Yeah, it's just like a weird energy. I, I can't, it's hard to know because then I also known a lot of great players that maybe didn't have those same opportunities but i feel like they're just as good or better than me and why are they maybe doing you know like I, or people that i believe in that are like why aren't they doing better or more or yeah. you know and and but it's also a precarious business that we're in you know and it's not an easy thing to maintain because there's always going to be young guys that are great Young players. Yeah, it's more than guys just guys and it's girls. More than just playing great. Yeah, it's and it's more than that. It's also your attitude and your outlook and how you, you know, sh- how you show up, what kind of energy you bring into the room. There's so many factors, you know. Like if you show up with a positive attitude and you give the person that's hiring you the feeling that you're psyched to be there, yeah. and that you're, and that you're there to support and and you have a good attitude because then it's like people think about, well, how's this person going to be to travel with, you know, and how's this? So there's all these other factors. It's not just, you can be a great player, but if you have a, an attitude or you're strange or you say, you know, your social skills are weird, you know, you might not get the gig, even though you're great. You know, I mean, I don't know. I think there's just so many things that, come into play i think it was maybe the first time i ever went to your website i was expecting i don't go check it out and then i came across your photography yeah i got really into photography being on the road it's super amazing and you've documented so much of your travels and people you've worked with people you've seen play just people just people on the street people you meet yeah street photography meeting people how big that's a pretty big part of your life huh yeah it was for a long time where i was like really into like 
dragging my camera around and taking photos. Like I like to wander off on my own, like on tour, if there's a day off, like I'm happy to just get do my own thing. I mean, I love hanging out with the with the with the bandmates, you know, and, and having a good meal together. But yeah, like I really got into photography, so I would wander off in Tokyo or I'd wander off in Barcelona with my camera and a map, you know, before smartphones like gotta find my way back to the hotel you know and yeah. oh i should go check out this thing in prague or you know yeah. i love the picture you used some great jazz and heritage festival pictures that are great have you ever considered um <laughs> making do you ever sell prints of some of these pictures no i i sold one print once have you ever thought about it or not really i mean not i just feel like photography man there's so many amazing photographers i feel very much like an amateur i sort of do it more for myself because I get a lot of joy out of it and I do share it a little bit here and there and I did have a, a little coffee house thing where I put up a bunch of my photos huh. and I actually sold a picture that's cool which was exciting so like you know it's something I want to do more I love the I love, I love the, photography you... I'm so into photographers I go to photo exhibits and living in New York is great for that and yeah I love on your Instagram that there's always just you pull stuff out from the past or there's new, just really neat photos. There's so many Yeah, oh, on the photos. Instagram, yeah, I like to throw, I don't really do a lot of like, this is what I'm doing. It's more like just photos of different places I've been or an image that I like, you know. It's yeah. a big part of music too, you know, and meeting people. I think the main important thing is just to be open and curious and flexible and positive and even if the situation isn't great, try to make the best out of the situation because there's always something to learn. Even if you're playing with people that maybe you don't like their groove, but there's something always to learn from every situation, you know? So I think it's all about being open-minded and being curious and interested and asking questions, not being afraid to like, hey, how do you do that? Or why does this chord, you know? I mean, sometimes I have like, you know, I'll be hanging out with Adam Levy, who's an incredible guitar player who I played with for years and had a little group with. But, you know, I know he knows a lot. I mean, he's a soulful guy, but he also knows a lot. So sometimes if I'm like, oh, what's the... Hey, Adam, can I play this note on this... You know, yeah. like, don't be afraid to ask questions, things you don't know. It's okay not to know. We, You know, it's okay not to know things. Even when you're older, it's you're never going to have it all figured out. Yeah, You know, it's a constant thing. It's like... You know, and then life, you know, you, life takes over too, you know. Life forces things we all have to deal with, you know. Yep, so there's right. so many factors, man, that come into your, you know, you just have to play and have your friends and, and, and have the music feel good so that you can be inspired to keep playing, you know. And sometimes it's okay to take a break or do other things or, you know, there's no, there's no real rules, you know. Just got to keep some shuffles in your life. Got to, yeah, keep playing the blues. <laughs> Andy, thanks so much for all Man, of this amazing thank you, information. thank you, Steve. And so, I'm happy we get so much fun together. This yeah, time. it's been great. And getting to play with you last night was so wonderful. Really great. Because you're a wonderful musician and player. And that was really fun. And Until next time, yes, we do it indeed. again. Yes, we will. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Loud Noise Podcast. I love to hear your feedback and want to make the show the best it can be. Please leave me a comment or tweet me at Steve Walsh Music on Twitter. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a couple minutes and leave me a review on iTunes. It helps get the word out about the show, plus I'd really appreciate it. You can subscribe to Loud Noise and you'll receive new episodes with new conversations full of tips, time savers, and advice to take your music to the next level. So dig in, get out there, and make great music. Until we meet again further on up the road, cheers. Cheers.